Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. I'm the social media manager for The Walking Dead. Yeah, that guy. Also, we got Woody Tondorf. He is our Skybound Games producer, and we have Alexander August, our podcast producer. Guys, how's it going? It's all right. It's going, it's going okay. It's a nice day. I can't see any other humans, so I mean, my health is in order. Good. Woody, have you, uh, has anyone caught on to the eating of the neighbors? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure I got away with this one scot-free, so now I gotta tell you, uh, I've, I've lost the thrill of it, I need, I need it again, and I'm, I'm starting to maybe, maybe downstairs. Wow, that's, uh... I'm just saying, I understand how serial killers get started. This week, we are covering Season 4, Episode 8, Too Far Gone. Obviously, this is the one where Herschel and the governor and a whole bunch of other people die. It is one of the most shocking episodes of the series to date. And we're going to talk about it. Uh, Woody, what do the people have to look forward to? Oh, boy. We've got, uh, we've got winners, losers, uh, some dunked on, uh, the world famous, sweeping the country, hit song of the summer, Apocatips. Let's start this thing off. Winners and losers, let's do this. Some people are winning, some people are losing, but it's the lock of dead, so everyone turns. Simple crash. So this was obviously a huge episode. The governor coming and invading the prison and killing Herschel in the process, and he gets got later my winner though is going to be daryl dixon who is the most resourceful guy in the apocalypse he is fantastic this whole time he he tells carl um he tells carl hey maybe don't shoot a shotgun 50 yards away it it's not gonna hit anyone um but more importantly daryl is just there for every moment he's throwing grenades back in tanks he is using a walker that almost kills him as a body shield he is using a bow and arrow to someone with point blank range and then also switching between that and a rifle it is crazy yeah this is this is the moment when uh, daryl reaches like mythic status like before he was he was a hero mm-hmm. but like this is like this is the legend this is carol blowing mm-hmm. up terminus like this yes. like he he throws a grenade down the barrel of a tank and <laughs> blows the tank like it's a up. second like, thought like oh it, just casual just just Mm -hmm. i wouldn't say yeets it because that's too much but like just just drops it in like it yeah i'm i think that's part of the fun part of this whole like of the re of this reanimated thing we've gotten to see darrow like from you know shane calling him like a little meth head teen or whatever to turning into what feels like this this could have been played by other people or directed a different way this could have really felt like just your typical like action movie schlock which looks great on a screen but in no way ever would be in real life this actually felt organic like we saw daryl earn this status step by step by step by step and it was such a goddamn delight to see him be like walker behind me walker in front of me moving around bow and arrow raffle bow and arrow raffle like it's just yeah This actually brings me to one of my low-key winners, which is the directing by Ernest Dickerson. He's uh, directed, like, 11 other episodes, including Coda, you know, the Beth one. And I thought the directing was fantastic, and I wish more episodes were like this. Like, I love the sequence when the governor's attacking, and they're just going from scene to scene to scene to scene. Like, you see the governor, like, come out, and then we cut to Daryl, and there's a walker that literally gets within, like, a millimeter of him. Cut. Cut to, like, the other thing, like, back to the governor. Like, with Herschel, it is crazy and the directing was so good um ernest dickerson also he's the cinematographer for spikes lee do the right thing and then also malcolm x uh which took some pretty liberal um you know sort of cinematography choices that were really like well known so film school johnny coming up for the pod today i'm just saying um you know i I I, I really enjoyed the pacing that's how you should shoot like a battle scene like i was entertained the entire time and you're right, because this is, in terms of, I have, I think I have written down a couple of times in my note, this is a brutal episode. There is so much that they pack in, and for it to be, for it to be as balanced and as just kind of, as paced and as balanced as perfectly as well as this is. I've heard people refer to The Walking Dead, like, in the, in this era, in this era of it, as light tight. The storytelling is light tight, and this is a great example of that, this episode completely agree um my loser this week is beach day you know you go you Aww. think you have these delusions <laughs> that uh you're gonna go to the beach and you're gonna have a good time what's really gonna happen is you're gonna get frustrated by parking you're gonna get flicked off by a nine-year-old uh sand's gonna get in other places your food's gonna get taken by a seagull and you're not gonna have a fun time um who else didn't have a fun time at beach day was lily and her daughter megan 
who got got by a flanking sand zombie. It's like, I remember watching this the first time and just being kind of gobsmacked that it was going to happen, that she was sitting there perfectly peacefully. It is a quiet, quiet little day by the creek. There is nothing for miles around. And I'm like, is this kid actually going to die? And yes, yes, she does. And I kind of liked it. Not that I like seeing children die at all, but I liked it because that actually felt really realistic. As much as kids in movies survive and have cool quips and, you know, generally come out like Carl in film and television... In real life, that is categorically not what would happen. Children are incredibly vulnerable. And it was like kind of a weird testament to how to that sort of gritty realism of The Walking Dead that this little girl could have been so easily taken like this. Yeah, the season four is really where you start to whittle out the like naive, like casual idiots do not survive past this point. Like right. yeah. you, you have to be pretty good at the apocalypse to, to keep on going. And like Rick mentions it uh, at this point uh, when they're having their whole like showdown of the fence being like, look how far we've come. And like the the ones like Lily and Megan who are, you know, just floating through the uh, through the existence of the post apocalypse, like the there's no more room for those folks or those sorts of silly errors or to not be vigilant all the time right. uh, by the time you get into the middle seasons. And you like get so used to Tara after season four that like you totally forget about Lily and Megan. Like Lily's her sister, Megan's her niece. Like that's crazy. Like, you know, you yeah. forget Tara even had a family and oh, Tara's totally. the reasonable one, which is how she like survived the only survivor of that Woodbury group, which is kind of crazy. Um, if there's a reason, guys, there's a reason that Dale went first. As much as I love him, there's a reason he didn't make it this far. <laughs> Bless his heart. Oh, you're oh right. yeah. Uh, Woody, winners and losers, I know you got them. Oh, the winner uh, is absolutely Michonne for me. Oh, yes, uh, just 100%. Look, we, I've been building to this and looking forward to it. I mean, ever since we said we were going to be doing the nostalgic episodes. Uh, but the first of all, like, carries herself through it and she's ultimately like the governor's big bad like he knows that this force (laughs) of nature is coming for him and he can never live in the same planet as this person because she is going to hunt him down um so to wit it's weird to me that he kills herschel first i would think like i don't know what he was hoping to accomplish like to like shock them maybe because he's just a patently bad guy but like michonne's number one the bigger threat there like i i just i don't know um like he doesn't hesitate to knock her out um at the beginning of the episode and then be like okay herschel put that down dude you're, you're not pointing that at anybody um but yeah michonne like has her last of the mohicans run once everything goes down and like she's just just like for uh for uh daryl like who's achieving like legendary status like taking down the tank michonne's whole deal like saving rick's life like perfectly impaling him as like rick is starting to like fade just like saves the day she has that incredibly heroic run she knows everything to do she hits every single button prompt in the uh, quick time uh game and just yeah it's she yeah 100 percent it the whole way and like i she's just she's the goat and the fact that she oh. called game at the beginning of the episode was just so oh. iconic where she's just like yeah i'm gonna kill oh, you yeah. by the end of this episode and he's like what epi- episode this is real life and she's like uh what are you talking about i'm not an actor and he's like i know no one said you were what what are you saying and he's don't look at the cameraman anyway the boom um, drops into the shot that's very it was very it was very sansa stark and battle of the bastards when like they go to that little meet and greet with ramsey right before <laughs> that used to be my drunkivity of choice is watching battle of the bastards i have seen that episode upwards of a hundred times anyway uh that little meet and greet that they have uh before the day before the battle eventually sansa's like this is bullshit john you can hang out here if you want to and she's like ramsey p.s you're gonna die tomorrow and he's like what and she's right and she gets to watch it and she does and uh we'll never know whatever happens with that series um what do you your loser <laughs> loser is hands down the tank yes uh, they <laughs> they R-A-T. show up to i mean look on paper that tank excuse the pun rolls over everything there's no like the and like the person mitch the guy driving it like rolled out of his national guard base like with his tank which first of all perfect flex second what the shit was happening at that point they're like yes the tank goes um but like they roll up there it's fully armed fully armored and they just like of course they roll over the fence they've got to go and like clear that but just like the tactical ineptitude that happens with the fucking tank like the if you were to handicap this fight between river group and the prison who is like out of all their supplies and all this stuff where and then they have a fucking tank and an armada of cars how they drop that is like 
you, they blew a 3-0 series lead and just like couldn't put it away and it, it to, and then to have Daryl just casually just like pop in the grenade in the exact opposite way that Shane dunked the burger in the uh, in the pilot like it, it's it's an embarrassment for the tank. It is 100% the biggest loser of the episode. Okay. Alexandra, winners <laughs> and losers. Let me hear them or give me death. Oh, man, that's a choice. Don't tempt her. That's a choice. Um, My winner is Carol, uh, remotely, because... <laughs> Lizzie, just Lizzie, hands down. I I understand that things don't, you know, go end well and great with Lizzie. You know, she 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 gets a little off track, which understandable. It's a weird time. Wait, Carol's not even in this episode. I know, but you know who saves Tyrese? You know who didn't just get on the bus with all of her friends to be safe? You know who helped and who nailed nailed Alicia right between the eyes? That was Lizzie because Carol taught her what to do. That's true. I did like that Carol like turned like homeschooling time to here's how to use a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's presence is so felt in this episode that she doesn't even show up, but she is in the credits as starring in the episode. <laughs> really? That's amazing. Well, yeah, yeah, they don't change it week by week. Um, Alexander, who's your loser? My loser this week is Dara. <laughs> Who just Tara, her what are you day. talking about? She's the lone survivor of her family. Yeah, but her entire group arrived with, like, oh. she came with the entire group she came with. Totally embarrassed her when she could have made some new friends. She gets there and they just start a murdering people. I will say she has my favorite, like, my, one of my favorite moments of the episode is when she basically decides not to fight. And Alicia runs around and she's like, "You gotta fight! You gotta pick up your guns!" Tara's like, "No, he he just killed someone with a." Sword. And she is I, every she is every millennial like actual audience member who was like, oh yeah, no, she's right. You would leave that situation a hundred percent. It was just yes. yeah. But so I just felt bad for Tara. She gets there and she realizes a minute too late that she made a very, very, very bad choice when it came to picking sides. But she also puts them in that situation because the governor does this whole kind of like, come on, guys, let's go kill these guys. I know you want to. We can't live in harmony. Let's go kill them. And then like there's silence. And then Tara goes, I'm in. So like, but, but at the same time, that's like, why she, she's like, the loser. You, it's a bad day. Exactly. Yeah. And it's by the end really of that day, day, all literally all of her family and friends are dead. So yeah, like, that's not Tara does not have a great day. No. No. I wish I wish I could say that it worked out better. But then she falls in love and that person dies. And then Alpha. All right, now let's get on to one of our favorite posterizing segments, Dunked On. Ooh, Ooh dunked, dunked On! All right, my Dunked On is that dissected rat that they find that we later find out is Lizzie's doing because Lizzie's fucking crazy. She's and, a monster. Uh, that rat got Taught by Carol. Dunked on. Like, the rat... Probably thought it was just going to die in a trap or, you know, natural causes. Nope. It got fucking crucified and, and like, and stripped to, like, pinged to a board. <laughs> this was... And I'm like, oh, my God. This was the rat too far gone. Like, if there is a little, like, that mini rat, rat apocalypse, this is the rat too far gone. And, yeah, I mean, the rats were probably having a really great time during the apocalypse until, until this, until they met Lizzie. Lizzie's their governor. Unless you were in King County, uh, and otherwise you were getting grabbed by this guy named Morgan who was using you in all these Excellent like traps point. as like zombies like just hang around you. If King County was still around, they'd definitely be like you know uh, toning down all the social distancing rules for sure. Um, oh, definitely. Uh, Woody, who's your dunked on? Uh, my dunked on is um, uh, Lizzie on Alicia. Oh, yes. The, yeah, as as the monster awakens, but the. First of all, I mean, like, shout out to uh, Tyrese finding the uh, the bulletproof potted plants to, uh, like, dive behind <laughs> as, like, Alicia and, like, three other dudes just, like, unleash hell on this thing, shooting everything but Tyrese. Um, and then, like, just when she's like, okay, like, this is it. I'm probably going to kill him. Like, realizes, like, never turn your back on children in the apocalypse, um, especially Lizzie. Um Oh my god! Like I just loved it. Like Lizzie's first reaction while all of it was going down, and like they put the child in care of Judith. But like Lizzie's like, you know what? We need guns. We should go get guns. Carol, Carol would like us to go get guns, and that totally pays off. Um, but just like the look on her face of like, you gotta be fucking kidding me! Before like Lizzie lights her up is just it. It's it's a dunked on moment for me. Did Lizzie Loki save Judith's life? 
Oh yeah, because then Tyrese comes and scoops up Judith. Yeah. Yeah, Tyrese is the one who gets who saves Judith. It's it's complicated. This show, Walking Dead. You know, you can't you can't have your alive Judith without having Lizzie be a, a monster. So, Alexandra, who would you say you're dunked on? My dunked on this week is the governor, and he fucking deserves it. Boy, I, there's not yeah. a single, single character on The Walking Dead that I hate more than the governor, because he just hits all of those entitled douchebag trigger right. points of mine. Like, he's just such an unsympathetic piece of shit. Like, even when he's, like, hugging that little girl, I'm like, her, like, what do you, was, stop touching her. She's not your little girl. And even your daughter, like, I, it wasn't really even your daughter. It's just, ooh, I fucking hate this guy. And when Michonne was just like, you're dead. Oop, you're not quite dead. I'm just going to leave you to die. And then Lily's like, oh, not me. Bam. Good night. Like, it was just, ugh. Sword through the chest. Yeah, tough, tough way to go. But then the show remembered, wait, like, he owes, like, at least two women. So, got you know, shanked by Michonne. And people will think that Michonne killed him. No, Lily killed him. Lily... I mean, he was going to die, but Lily killed him. And then I was looking on the wiki, and I was like, wait, what happened to Lily? And then I became a Lily truther for, like, five minutes. And then I read that, (laughs) I guess, someone mentions later that she gets, she's so overcome by grief for some reason. She just gets consumed by walkers. I mean, it could have been the death of her daughter. I don't know. Lily had a tough couple of months. It was time for the the governor to go at that point. Like, the, this dude is just so, like patently evil and just but like oscillates between like sheer like manic cold-blooded like mass murderer to like charming low-level like crime boss type deal um yeah the idea that like rick actually talks him out of it or like talks the group out of wanting to like fight everybody and he's just like no fuck it i want i want to fight right it's just yeah there's something that's so like petulant and just like and almost childish to him like he has he's such a spoiled brat narcissist that he just needs he needs everyone to do what he wants to do and treat him the way he wants to be treated and he needs like he need he has this this toddler-esque need for control that just makes me like there are villains that i enjoy and like alpha i enjoy the shit out of alpha i do i like I don't even enjoy, I don't enjoy the governor. He's that well wrought as a villain. I just want to punch my television screen in the face. So you like almost start to like feel for him or see him as a human when like he's bonding with Megan and you know he's in that ditch and he saves her and this and that. But then like then he'll gun down like all of his people randomly and you know do the crazy fucked up things he does later. And you're like, oh, this guy's crazy. I can't feel bad for him. There are a couple moments in the episode, though, where you're like, this guy is on the level. He understands how this all, like, works. Like, I know that it uh, that it creeped out when he was, like, holding Megan. But, like, you do look at that as, like, the same guy who had these, like, genuine moments of tenderness with his, like, zombified daughter. Um, and you do have this moment of kind of, like, oh, like, he, like, this is... He, he he doesn't stop. He always finds replacement people for everybody that he lost. So, like, he lost his wife. He found Andrew, who looks exactly like his, like, dead wife. Um, loses his daughter and goes and, like, adopts Megan, essentially. Um, and then, like, has a moment with Herschel and Michonne where he says, like, I acknowledge my daughter was dead. Like, I know that now type deal. And you're like, oh, well, is this, is this guy, like, all right? And then just goes and full tilt crazy villain murder guy. Um, and just like you said, it's, it's nuts. What kind of weak dick shit is it to kill an elderly guy with one leg who's kneeling? Like, you should have killed... Like, you, you had Michonne right there. You should have killed her. Like, you know... It doesn't make sense. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. It's like, oh, which would have a more emotional impact? The old person who everyone knows is going to die or, or this badass lady? Yeah, I mean, essentially... Well, if one of the things that I really love about this episode in particular is just the performances, period. And that... I and I kind of... I wrote that down when I was looking at Rick looking at Herschel in this last moment and knowing what those two had meant to each other. Because this is really, like... This is kind of everyone's plateau moment since the pilot. This is this is pretty much as I... And correct me if I'm wrong. This is kind of as bad as it gets since the pilot. I don't think it has gotten any worse than what happens in this episode. Or beforehand, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and seeing that moment between Rick and Herschel and Rick just kind of realize that this is going to happen, but he still has people to take care of. And he has to move beyond that was really exceptional and Herschel like Herschel had kind of done his job as a character he'd gotten Rick he'd be yes. he'd become the moral he'd become the moral standard by which everyone else would try to which everyone else would try and ascend like he becomes the gold standard for how to behave and he 
he completes his arc and even when he's about to get you know, even when he does get the sword to the neck he doesn't even flinch like he has already accepted his fate he knows what's going to happen and that gives me some kind of peace when they're like horrified as they're dying you really feel bad but Herschel's like, I accept this. Like, if anyone had to be sacrificed, he probably would have volunteered because he's like, save these people, you know? But that's the difference between like having like a story and an arc that you want to do for this character and like the logic of what's going on in that moment. Yeah. So oh, yeah. like to me, there's like I, I get it, like I get all the reasons why Herschel has to die, but it doesn't make any sense to me why the governor who like through weeks or months or however long this was going on, like has at his mercy the woman who has told him she will murder him has like ninja stealthed her way into his apartment and like taken <laughs> everything he holds dear and, killed his and also is the only one of the two who has two legs like kill that person first like it just feels like an austin powers dr evil type thing of like i have a gun in my room type deal and i don't know it makes sense for the story but to me it, it yeah, I also think that as Herschel accepted his death, if he had aimed the sword at Michonne instead, I, I there's got to be some way that she would duck and then like headbutt him in the nuts and then somehow <laughs> yeah. get up and then use the sword to like free herself, kill two people, and then Rick starts shooting from afar and all that. Um, oh, one quick thing, um, I love <laughs> this is my least favorite thing in movies slash most favorite thing uh, and TV shows where, like, two characters are, like, 50-plus yards away from each other, and they're just, like, speaking at slightly higher of a volume than they normally do. Yes. And they can completely... Yes. That's, like, that's why my favorite part of Shazam, they address that, where, like, the, the evil guy's, like, revealing his plan, and Shazam's like, I, I can't hear you. You're, like, half a mile away. <laughs> yeah, no, Rick sh uh, yeah, Rick's shouting at him, and the governor's responding in, like, a perfectly normal tone of voice. And, like, Daryl later, like, calls it out, being like, it's over 50 yards. So, like, yeah. neither of these guys can hear each other. Yeah, all right. So now this brings us to our most useful, talked-about segment, in my mind. It's called Apocatips. Look, guys, in these trying times, in these uncertain circumstances, we all need advice on how to live our new normal. Thankfully, we have a new segment called Apocatips, where we take some information from the episode and we apply it to real life and we give you some good advice. So, Woody, why don't you start us off? Look, can you blow up a tank with a grenade tossed down the barrel of it? The answer is actually yes. There is really? a video of it and everything. Yeah. Hell uh, yes. and, and I want it. I, it, it absolutely red flagged my search history. Um, it, you have to be very lucky about the timing of it. Essentially, like, the tank has to shoot the round, and then you have to drop the grenade in as they're essentially, like, cycling out, like, the powder uh... and the next round. So, like, the breach or whatever that, like, otherwise it's just going to land within the barrel, and then it just, like, blows up in the barrel and nothing happens. My pocket tip this week. If your leader is dropping people's heads off with a sword, especially elderly ones missing limbs, you might be the bad guy. I hate to break it to you, all this terrorist talk has really gotten you riled up and he's provided food occasionally and you know you have the walker fight matches, those are fun, but you know, when he's taking a helpless guy with one leg who's elderly and he's chopping his head off, you might be the villain group. Hate to break it to you. Yeah. E examine examine your life choices. Think twice. Do just like do a background check. <laughs> Alexandra, any pocket tips for us? I do. I got I got three quick ones. Lose an eye, become a better shot. We've seen lots of ways to come become a better shot. If you escape an explosion at the CDC and you know other tense situations, it'll make you better shots. And that the third one is lose an eye. So uh, if Michonne says she is going to kill you, or some kind of badass woman who comes equipped with a sword and, a, and is staring at you with pure unadulterated hatred in her eyes, if that person says that she's going to kill you, run. Like, yeah, believe yeah. her. It's going to happen. <laughs> like, don't d take that seriously. Just go. Like, if you run, you'll probably be fine. But if you wait around any longer, she will make good on that promise. Oh, yeah. And uh, don't trust your dad. Shoot the governor. Always, always shoot the governor. Yeah, do you have to not trust your dad before you shoot the governor, or is it just always shoot the governor? And that's it's always like the, shoot the that's governor. The rule. Always okay. shoot the and governor. And then decide if you should or should not trust your dad. Exactly. If your dad is standing in the way of you shooting the governor, or trusting your dad is standing in the way of you shooting the governor, don't trust your dad. Shoot the governor. All right, and that wraps up a pocket tips. I hope you guys use this information, take it to heart, and apply it to real life. Now we are going to go on to our guest.
Our guest this week is the supremely talented actress who played Mika on The Walking Dead. We also know her from Speechless, The Night Shift, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie, and soon he's going to be in Tina Fey's show, Mr. Mayor. Kyla Kennedy, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I am so good. Um, I am just excited to talk to you. You know, despite all the amazing things you've done in your career, I really love the show you did, uh, Down and Dirty. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> no those are so funny. Thank you. It's mortifying for me to look back on those now, but I can appreciate them for what they are. But those, that, like, <laughs> at the time, I, I didn't realize that those would be on the internet forever. So <laughs> oh, yeah. They're, those are something they're, that my friends like to pull out on me occasionally. When <laughs> they're not even embarrassing. You're, like, really funny in those. Did you write those? Or did you, I did, like... I did it. Nick Floyd and I, we um, came up with the concept together, and... Um, yeah, we, we, I wrote most of the questions and then we would like walk around cons because I used to do this a lot and um, we would ask people questions that they would be too afraid to ask. Like that was the whole idea. Just like, you know, right. things like you'd want to ask somebody, but you'd maybe be a little bit too nervous to or be like, maybe that's too bold. And so that, yeah, no. it, just, it happened so fast, actually. I was rewatching some of them just for research and they still hold up. Just letting you know, the Norman Reedus one is my favorite because um, you get him, he's usually that was, so... That was crazy. Yeah, he's, yeah he's like so loose in that interview, so it's really yeah, good. All right, so how have you been holding up in quarantine? I've been, I've been pretty good. I mean, recently I've been going a little stir crazy, just because yeah. like I've been trying to go outside and go on hikes, but you can only do that for so long. I feel like once you go around the neighborhood, like the fifth time that week, you're done, you're over it. Um, totally. But this is nice, getting to meet a new person, even if it's Hey, a new hi, yes. <laughs> and talk but um i mean obviously it's we, we we need to do it so it does give me a little bit of a sense of purpose staying home i feel like i'm helping the only way i can but it's definitely yeah. it's definitely stressful yeah it's absolutely stressful um okay so let's start from the beginning um you grew up actually in you grew, or you're from south carolina right yes yeah what yeah. part i actually also grew up in south carolina i'm from columbia really i grew up yeah. in charleston but Carlson. I moved to Atlanta when I was old enough that like that's what I would consider where okay. I grew up. But definitely, I lived in Charleston until I was about five, so that would be home. But gotcha. I couldn't, I couldn't <laughs> tell you much about it. So lots of memories from there. Um, so you you started acting at uh, an early age, like eight, right? Yeah, I was about eight, eight or nine when I when I actually started. Okay, and what kind of work were you doing initially? Just honestly, whatever I could, I've wanted to do it since I was three. Like it was just, mm -hmm. I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. But my mom, obviously, you know, what kid doesn't want to be an actor? So she didn't take it right. too seriously. Um, yeah. But I, once I was in Atlanta, there's obviously more opportunities out there. So anything mm -hmm. I could audition for, I would just do. Um, and wow. one of the first, yeah. So when I did like a little TV movie out there. And like, mm -hmm. once I did that, I just... I didn't stop. I just kept going. I didn't want to, I wow. Didn't yeah. So, um, and so how did you fall into The Walking Dead? That was, I got that audition. I believe I was out here by that point, coming back and forth. Okay. And, uh, I had, I'd never heard of it before. Neither had my mom. I didn't want mm -hmm. to do it at first because I was in school and I was like some stupid zombie show. I don't want to, you know. Yeah. Do yeah. Yeah. It. <laughs> and um, my mom was like, you know what, we'll just take you after hour. You can just pave it really quickly. Um, I remember the sides were really strange because obviously they couldn't release the script. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just like a weird scene. And I, I like I went in, and I taped it. Uh, I didn't hear anything back. And then they wanted me to fly out to Atlanta to go yeah. to a screen test. And I was like, not for it. I was like, I've got school to worry about. And wow. I was, in fifth grade. I was like, I was like, I can't just drop everything and go to Atlanta for this zombie show. Like that's like, all that was going through my mind. Yeah. So um, I did a Skype call, not Zoom, Skype. Mm -hmm. Girl and Gail and Heard and, and um, we kind of did the scenes online. And mm -hmm. from there I got it and then I flew out. Wow, that's insane. And so obviously, um, a lot of people, when they talk about your character, they also mention Brighton's character, Wizzy. Um, yeah. And I understand that you guys actually knew each other beforehand. Yeah, no, Brighton and I went to the same school. We actually both got the call in the car that they wanted us to screen test together. Because originally, oh. Mika was supposed to be a brother. It was going to be a brother and a sister. So oh, we okay. both read for Liz, And we were in the car. 
my mom had just picked us and we were like, they're going to cast both of us. Like we were just joking around with yeah, it. Yeah, it's yeah. like, when that happen? Especially being out here, like everyone you know is an actor. But right. we were like, we just kind of knew. We were like, they're going to cast both of us. So they did. They brought us both in for a screen test. And, oh. and actually we had good chemistry. She was like his friend, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty rare. Um, we're actually, I'm actually interviewing her tomorrow. We're doing sort of like a double header. I was like, well, if we you know we're doing Kyle, we got to do Brighton. So yeah, um, of course. I know. So very excited for that. And are you guys still in touch? Oh, yeah. Actually, I love her. She's still like one of my closest friends. I obviously haven't been able to really see her that much because of quarantine. Sure. But we yeah. talk all the time. Yeah. I, we're always, I think we're always going to be friends just because like we have so many memories together. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's great. That's awesome. So what do you remember from your time on The Walking Dead? Oh gosh, so much. That was like, I was like 10 when I started the show, obviously. That's so crazy. I was young, I know. But I just remember that was like the first set I was on where I felt like I was treated as an equal almost. If yeah, that yeah, yeah. I was so nervous going into it. Not even because of the zombies, just because I was like, oh, these people have been on the show for so long. I'm just going to like mm -hmm. come on in here. I was scared to work with Melissa, I remember, because I was like, she's so good, and I don't know if I can do it. And everyone on that show, the kindest people, and I know that people always say that when they're working right. on the show, they're like, oh, they're amazing. But every single person on that show was so kind and humble and like welcomed me with open arms. And, and the zombies were great. I remember Greg took me into the trailer one day and showed me how they kind of did the makeup so I wasn't scared oh that was no important way. for me <laughs> I was wow. just curious I was like how do they how do they do that I remember like with the chard walkers I was fascinated they were on fire oh, yeah that, that was crazy that is insane um so when did you I just actually watched the grove the other day and that that episode is still amazing um one of the best episodes people still regard we're like 10 seasons in um when did you get the call about uh your character getting killed off I got the call, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it was like two weeks before. And it was like always a joke that if you got a call from nothing, like you knew something good wasn't going to happen. Cause like yeah. I didn't really talk to the big people upstairs. And I just remember like the second I got the call, I was like, okay, you know what? Like I kind of sensed it was coming a little bit. Mm -hmm. It had been thrown around. Um, I was really sad to leave the show. But I think that the way I went out, I wouldn't change it. Because I think that episode is so... I never watch anything I'm in, ever. Like, I yeah, just... Yeah. I'm not one of those people. But that yeah. episode, I've watched. And it's like, I'm able to take myself out of it. And, like, I don't see it as me playing. And it's just... The way it was written, it's just insane. I think that, you know, I just feel lucky to... That's if I was to, That's how I was going to die. I'll die that way. <laughs> A way that... No. It's you know, insane, too. And... um it's Melissa McBride also, you know, like you said, is so amazing in that episode. And, you know, I found out sort of recently that she used to be a casting director, which seems so terrifying if you're an actor. Like, right. no. holy crap. Um, so when did you sort of figure out, because you said you weren't really aware of like The Walking Dead, like before you got on the show, when did you start like figuring out like how sort of big it was um, once you were on it? The first little sign I got was when we were doing the track scenes. Mm -hmm. Like, we were walking on the tracks, and people were coming out, like, from their homes and taking pictures, and I'd never been on anything like that where people cared enough. I mean, usually, right. usually things are big after the fact. Um, mm -hmm. So I kind of noticed that, but I didn't realize how big it was till I think I did, like, a con. I don't know. I mean, at this point, I did, like, my first con right before I died, right. I think. And, like, seeing all the people there, I mean, it's right in front of your face like yeah. seeing how, how many people care about the show and like how into it they are I was like this is huge this is insane I'm like I've never seen people dress up as other people like and know everything about the show which I yeah. thought was so cool and that's it's crazy insane to me that, yeah that I was I know. on that also, somebody got one of my lines and Brighton's tattooed on them which Whoa. that for me was like <laughs> okay, like, you guys are dedicated. I don't know oh if anything crazy like this is going to happen again. But those, yeah, the fans are amazing on that show. So um, so after Walking Dead, you're still pretty young, but you, I mean, your IMDb is, like, really impressive. Like, you're not even 18 yet. Like, that's kind of insane. <laughs> um, it, how, how far until you get uh, speechless, or how long until you get speechless? Oh, gosh. I got 
speechless a little bit after Walking Dead. I think I did like a few recurrings on some shows after. And I that was in Atlanta. So I remember I took some time to be with my family after I got okay. killed on that one. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. To be with them. Um, but speechless wasn't too far after. I did that. I forget. We've been, we were on for three years. Um, it was in a pretty similar time, which I was happy to do that. I remember at that time, I was kind of figuring out if I wanted to, because I had like talked about maybe doing a drama or speechless, which is a comedy. And I'm, I think I, I chose speechless just because of the message behind it. I was really passionate about, you know, what it stood for. And also I thought doing a comedy would be fun. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I was like I yeah, but my sister, let's make some people laugh. <laughs> Right, but it's not like just like, you know, a comedy to be a comedy. I mean, like it really had a great message to that show. Oh, like yeah. it was, in, uh, you know, it's a thing that you've never seen. And I think I saw in another interview, you had said that typically for people who are uh, disabled, um, they typically just cast normal people. So, yeah. Which, yeah, so, so yeah. The creator of the, of the show, Scott Silveri, about it. Um, when I went in to do the screen test, I talked to him after and, um, my sister was born, she had a brain hemorrhage at birth. So to me, oh, the story wow. was very and close to home. Um, mm. And I just feel like personally, whenever I would see a movie or a show that depicted someone with special needs, A, half the time it was an actor and or if it, it would just always be kind of dark and gloomy and kind of, you know, focus on the negative aspects. And obviously that is a real thing that people face. But I also think that you know, everybody has bad moments and everybody struggles sure. with it. There's also so many good moments in life and, yeah. and, and we all face our own different challenges. And I wanted to focus on, you know, we just, you know, everybody goes through things, but let's focus on the, the good parts of life and the things that can happen. And I don't know, the show just opened up so many great discussions. Um, I just feel so lucky that I was able to be a part of it. Yeah. What, what did, I guess, what did you learn the most from that show? Honestly, I just, I think I learned people, misconceptions about people with disabilities I mm -hmm. had never been one to think um oh maybe this person can do this or you know we shouldn't have this people do this but people would come up to me on the streets um and be like you know I didn't think anybody that had CP could act and like just say things like that and I think that like you know what I mean like things that they yeah. just and it's just people being naive I don't think it's necessarily them trying to be mean or, or hurtful but just like talking to people seeing this and realizing we shouldn't make assumptions about what people can and cannot do. And, and every person's different. And some people are comfortable with this and some people aren't. Um, and so I just think opened up a lot of good discussions. And also I got to work with another amazing cast. Um, yeah. Micah and Mason and Manny. I mean, I just, Manny. I feel very lucky with the shows. That yeah. And you got to meet John Cleese. Yes, I know. I got to work with him in London. That was insane. That was crazy. That, that was I like was like, holy moment. crap. Yeah. Yeah. How, was that like, man, that must have been just like great acting, like in the moment, like to not be freaking out and to just act normal. Like that was such a great scene. Right. And also his presence is just so like, I hear, like, I feel like, you know, some people have that energy where they just walk into a room and everybody has to look at them. So yes. I remember like when he came on set, I was like, I got to play it so cool. <laughs> to just completely, I yeah. just went up at the same time I'm like he's, I've got it the respect I have for him is so high but I like <laughs> for sure but he kind and he, he was great with us so unfortunately speechless ended but um you now are on to a new show that I've read about that uh people don't know too much about but it's called Mr. Mayor right starring Tent Danson and it's Tina Fey's show right yeah yeah I um uh, I just started this one. We were on episode three that we stopped at right before everything kind of went down. Um, yesterday, I just kind of posted like my first little thing about it. Uh, but yeah, I'm doing a new show on NBC. Tina Fey, Robert Carlock created it. Um, I played Ted Danson's daughter. It's called Mr. Mayor. So oh that, my God. There. So that's going to be really fun to, to do. I'm excited, but at the same time, like <laughs> I'm still nervous about it because, you know, it takes a second to like, I'm working with people that I like don't even think should know my name. <laughs> I mean, you've already worked with Minnie Driver and Andrew Lincoln, Melissa McBride, John Cleese. So, you know, Ted Danson. I mean, you you are you are allowed to act with him, I think. I mean, that I think it's incredible. I mean, I don't think so. Not yet. You don't but think I'll okay. fake it. <laughs> I agree. I'll fake yeah. it. Do you think like 
there's going to now be like a sea of quarantine content when all this is over. Like we're going to see quarantine movies and COVID shows and things like that. I, I mean, I think so. I personally have been like trying to just like write and do things. And I know some of my friends have done like voiceover things. Yeah. So like, I think that a lot of stuff will be coming out from this. I think it's a nice break for the earth. I'm ready for it to be over, obviously. Yes. <laughs> and I think we should look at the positives yeah. while we can. Um, you know, we're giving the earth a second to breathe and to, to clean up a little bit. Um, but I think that everyone's going to be, I'm really motivated to work now. I know I've never oh. wanted to work more in my life than I do right yep. now. <laughs> I know. Um, we have a question we sometimes ask guests. It's pretty important. So I just wanted to run it by you. Um, would you rather fight five goose-sized Negans or one Negan-sized goose? Oh, God. I know. It's, it's kind of one of those, like, inside the actor studio questions that, you know, we just try to slip in there. Probably one Negan-sized goose, because hear me out, okay? Okay. I am a good hider mm -hmm. and I think that if there were just one of them I could I could figure out a way to outsmart him oh yes I don't know I think that's where it gets tricky the more you <laughs> the more you pile up the easier it is for one of them to come up on you when you're oh for sure and I just know myself in the moment I'd be like are there four or are there five like I just forget like I can't lose count. remember if you said five yeah. you could have said four so it just wouldn't so it just wouldn't work for me <laughs> just like five mini Jeffrey Dean Morgans with bats. I think that'd be kind of cool, but um, yeah, hard to handle. And um, just one more in Death Stranding, the video game that Norman Reedus starred in, he had a um, he scaled mountains with a fetus in his backpack. Uh, if you were the star of Death Stranding, what would you put in your backpack? Oh gosh, I know it's I another it. really serious actor question. Oh my gosh, um. It depends. It depends. Okay, I'll yeah. give like a lame answer and then I'll give sure. like my tree. It's like obviously okay. I'd choose like water, right? Sure. That's what I'm yeah. But if I could choose like a fun, I'd bring like a Nintendo Switch. That way yes. Animal Crossing while I was up there and I'd be Oh fine. my. Animal Crossing is saving me from quarantine. I am me obsessed. Too. I'm so glad I found that. <laughs> yes, I don't even use Pinterest, but I've been looking at Pinterest for different ideas. I've been adding waterfalls. I've been like making My mountains really impressive really impressive. yeah Not to it is insane yeah so um with all your work are you still able to go to school and everything or i actually graduated so i oh yeah so when i was on speechless i had a set teacher with me and i just didn't take a break i just kept going so i didn't take summers um so i completely graduated school which mm -hmm. has been nice but I continue to take like online college courses just so I'm not sitting oh, okay. around, which has yeah. been helpful, you know, especially during something like this. So you have something to do. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, what sort of thing? So you have Mr. Mayor coming up, obviously. Um, what else do you want to get into? Do you want to just keep acting? Do you want to do other things? Like how do you see I'm your life? I'm interested in like producing. That's Ooh, something yeah. I'm going to do. Definitely. I've been talking about that with my team for a minute now. Finding some of my own projects, I think, are, are really exciting to me. I think, like, getting to see it develop and grow, is gonna, it would be really, really cool. Um, but for now, I'm mainly just focusing on acting. I was getting, trying to get into, like, other things. I like to, I'm the type of person, I have severe ADHD, so I like to learn a new skill every day, is what my mom calls it. Like, oh, yeah. like I'll wake up and I'll be like, I'm learning French. And the next day, I'm like, so <laughs> I'm a ballerina now. <laughs> like, I'm all over the place. So, like, I mainly focus on acting at the moment, just so right. I don't, like, go too far off track. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I think that during this time, I'm going to try and start figuring out some more. Wow, that's things. awesome. Well, I'm so glad to hear you're doing well, and it was so great talking to you. Um, tell people where they can follow you on social media so they can learn more. At Kyla Kennedy. I don't post too often, but when I do, I think they're quality posts. Quality <laughs> posts, guys, guaranteed by Kylo Kennedy. All right, thank you so much for talking to me. And, um, you know, enjoy quarantine. Hopefully we'll get out of this soon. Enjoy Animal Crossing. You too. <laughs> you, Johnny. You too. Thank you. All right. See Bye. you, Kylo. Bye. Bye.
All right, before we wrap up this week's episode, we are gonna do some quick stray arrows. These are some observations that we made while watching that didn't fit in other segments, but we wanted to mention anyway. We have to, we'll, we'll literally explode if we don't. So without further ado, um, I will start it off with the well actually facts. Um, Give it to this, us. A lot of this episode came from issue 48 uh, of the comics, which is funny because this is episode 408. So if you believe in divine intervention, it's proven. This is actually the last time that Beth sees Maggie alive. Uh, very sad. The next time she sees her, she's Aww. all uh, limp in her arms at a hospital. So that's weird. What What a fond and happy memory to look back on. Well, I haven't seen you since the last time we were both firing our assault rifles in anguish and watching our father get decapitated. Woody, give us some stray arrows. Uh, my only one is just a quick one. Uh, silent credits. Um, you know, that's the the ultimate salute for, uh, for fallen characters. Mm, um, yeah. I remember when... Uh, Back in the day, there was a there was a show called Twenty Four, and when uh and it always ended with this like beeping clock type thing, and when any like major shocking character death happened, it was a silent clock, and everybody's like, "Oh my fucking god, <laughs> the silent <laughs> clock!" And that was how life was back then. Alexander, what kind of stray arrows do you have? I was gonna actually touch on what a brutal episode this was, and I was gonna list the sheer amount of people who died, but you kind of, hmm, hmm. Well, actually, okay, here are the Stepped names. Stepped on that a little bit. <laughs> A little bit, a little bit. But, okay, so 31 people. But let's count it up by name. Alicia dies. Tank Dude dies. Herschel dies. Lily dies. That rat dies. Judith. Judith kind of dies in this episode. I mean, for all intents and purposes, we think she's dead. And it was such a... That crucified rat actually had a pretty successful con tour. You know, I mean, they were at all the conventions. <laughs> yeah. They really they really hit the road. And, you know, they really I, bought I that should... rat... The rat in the season nine cast like really bonded, like they were tight. <laughs> <laughs> yep, at, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then fi- finally, just this was a really. Every once in a while, I get really fucking annoyed that this show has never received a deserved Emmy nomination. I feel Woody the way I feel when Battlestar Galactica season four was around, and I was like, "This is Mary yeah. McDonald's last chance." to get an Emmy nomination and I heard that her name was like in pre-discussions and then she didn't get one and we all thought it was a huge injustice this was another one of this was an episode where I was like why the fuck didn't Andy Lincoln get a fucking Emmy nomination for this anyone in this episode it is so good and it really makes me cranky that Emmy voters are like weirdly genre like genre annoyed or or were then like it wasn't until yeah I will say as as amazing as um Andrew Lincoln played that scene with all the raw emotion, thinking that his daughter was dead, and, you know, he just lost Herschel and almost Michonne. He doesn't know where half his people are. This was sort of the birth of the choral meme, which yes. is, you know, I think almost better than an Emmy because it's something that we – it's a gift that keeps on giving. The Emmy just – The choral on, meme uh, deserves an Emmy. Mantle. The cor- – but, you know, I mean, he really – because I was like – I remember like hearing that meme and I was like, I don't, I don't really think he says Carl like that. Like I, I know he's doing a British accent to Southern accent, which can be hard, but I don't, I don't think I've heard it. And then rewatching this episode and he's like, Carl, Carl. <laughs> I was like, Oh boy. I'm picturing them like going, cause this was the mid season finale. And then like after this, like, cause we didn't have the Coral meme, like that picture of him, like sobbing, like as he's holding on to Carl. And then everybody's trying to do like the dad, uh, the walking dad jokes, like meme was going with that as well. But I'm picturing like you finish that on set and like Andrew Lincoln, like goes through all of that where like Rick has essentially like his trachea crushed underneath of like the mm. governor. So like, of course he's coming out of that rasping and like gasping for breath And, like, Andrew Lincoln just, like, selling that for, like, hours and, like, going to that place. And then for that episode to come out and be like, great, we did it. Oh, what the fuck? What are these memes? Oh, god damn it. Like, that's, to me, is just exquisite. Thank you guys so much for listening. Next week, we are covering The Grove. Obviously, this is the big Look at the Flowers episode with Kara, Lizzie, Mika, Tyrese, Judith. So much goes on. I can't wait to talk to you guys about it. Can't wait for a guest. And um, I think that's all we have. It's a weird timing for a musical episode is all I'm going to say. But, you know, that's, I'm, I'm working on the, uh, the Look at the Flowers uh, reprise, and it's, it's coming along. Thank you guys so much. As always, happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. The governor's backstory in the comments is very, very different. I, Thank God they didn't do some of that stuff. That, that's too God. much. Thank God. Like...